Okay, so now we'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about some early signs of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And um, um, so you, you will notice in the early stage uh, this trouble with memory loss and primarily short-term memory with usually very good preservation of more remote memory. So all of your historical, you know, data like, you know, where you were born and your family are, all those things tend to be very well preserved until much later in the, in the uh, illness. What you will tend to forget is who called today, what message did, did, was I supposed to give you, uh, where did I leave my car keys, those kinds of things. Um, there is increasing difficulty performing complex tasks, and that would include things like um, uh, banking, um, things like um, keeping your appointment calendar, that kind of thing. Uh, if people are still working, often that would translate into difficulties on the job, and persons might be reprimanded for for um, you know not keeping up to par with their work or. Uh, they might decide that they actually can fulfill their functions at work uh, because they are constantly um, getting into trouble with forgetting key things that, that, that uh, they should um, be remembering. Um, so we've got these uh, 10 warning signs, uh, which the Alzheimer disease publishes and you know, is in a lot of the pamphlets that the um, uh, Alzheimer's Society has. And so, these are the, the type of memory loss that affects day-to-day -day function. So don't forget that for any of these conditions to reach a threshold for diagnosis, they actually need to have associated with them a degree of functional impairment. You don't make a diagnosis until the disease is actually encroaching on the person's ability to fulfill their, uh, their everyday uh, responsibilities and tasks. Um, so, but as time goes on, you will see more difficulty with the ability to perform very familiar things like, you know, a recipe that you might know quite well or, you know, how to fix a certain kind of thing, you know, how to do a, a fixing job around the house. Shoes. That would be a problem. I'm thinking more in the early signs uh, would be things like if you were um, a, a person who's handy, you know, uh, with carpentry or something that now you can't figure out how to use that screwdriver or how to fix the door on your cover, that kind of thing. Yeah. These might be early signs of a problem. Um, or you might still be able to do it, but it'll take you longer and it'll be more difficult for you to get organized to do it. Right? Like eating a meal. Eating a meal would be a later. That would One be a later. Right, right, so time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Problems with language, I think we've uh, talked about that. So. Um, uh, commonly, it's word finding problems, and there's another another kind of issue that occurs is the replacement of the correct word with another word that sort of sounds like the same thing, or uh, or maybe has an associated meaning but is not quite right. It doesn't quite fill that void for the actual word that you need to find. Um, problems with keeping track of time. That's a common early issue in the diagnosis. Uh, does it, being unaware of where you are, I would tend to think that that's more of a later stage uh, kind of problem. Um, the you know, difficulties with judgment and uh, action, uh, problems with conceptual thinking, um, and uh, changes in mood and behavior we've uh, discussed already, changes in personality. Now, a common thing that, uh, uh, that I uh, uh, get asked about is that the person may, it seems to a family member sometimes that the person is, uh, might be depressed because they seem to lack initiative or lack interest, uh, and they seem to uh, be much more passive than they used to be. So that, that perhaps is a common um, um, change in mood and behavior that might occur with a condition like this. Um, it can also go kind of in the other direction, where there may be more um, aggressiveness or argumentativeness or, um, you know, that kind of personality change. So the, the changes in personality can be many and varied, you know, in the course of the uh, illness. Okay, and I think we're now almost at the end now. So we're, we're just a quick word about uh, diagnosis. Um, 
One thing to keep in mind is that um, there's no uh, single test for Alzheimer's disease and that it is a clinical diagnosis. So unlike, say, diabetes, uh, I can send you to the lab and, and do a blood test and then say, yes, this is what it is from a test like that. When, when physicians talk about something being a clinical diagnosis, they're really talking about the fact that, again, you know, you're trying to match those symptoms to, to the closest approximation that meets one of these types of dementia that I've mentioned. So, you know, there is a degree of error in this. Um, the, the best um, analysis of it suggests that uh, about 90% of the time, it's an accurate uh, diagnosis made clinically using these steps. Um, the neuropsychological evaluation may improve the accuracy a little bit more still, uh, but there's still some error there because a lot of these diseases overlap, even some of their pathologies overlap. So, you know, it's not, um, it's not absolute diagnosis unless there's actually a biopsy of the brain to look at what is the pathology there. Um, um, there's a role for blood work, and that's to screen for other things that can be corrected, like the thyroid problem, or the calcium problem, or the B12 deficiency. So blood work is done for those reasons. Um, as, as well, in terms of investigation, most people in Canada today will have a CAT scan done of their brain. The CAT scan is done for several reasons. One is to make a more accurate diagnosis because you may think it's Alzheimer's disease, but when the scan comes back, there's actually a small stroke there that indicates, no, it's mixed. It's a mixture of, of features, you know, the vascular feature and maybe the Alzheimer feature. Um, so the CAT scan can, can help in diagnostic accuracy. The CAT scan also excludes other things like, a, you know, is there a tumor or a hemorrhage or something of that sort that's causing the problem. So the CAT scan is recommended for those reasons. There's not a great deal more merit in terms of doing more sophisticated things. So, you know, sometimes we'll ask for an MRI, but that would be a rarer type of situation. Um, the MRI can be helpful. It's a little bit more sensitive to picking up small strokes, small lesions. Um, it's, it's a great uh, test to do if you think it's multiple sclerosis, which is another degenerative disorder, but with a different pattern. So the MRI can be help, very helpful in, in some very discrete kinds of situations, but it usually doesn't offer a whole lot more than the CAT scan for the majority of patients. Um, there's a wonderful new technology called a PET scanner, um, which is not available in Newfoundland, but is more and more um, available in other parts of the world. And uh, the, the latest technology is able to actually um, tag the, that amyloid protein that I mentioned that deposits in the brain. So the PET scan can actually tag that and produce a picture that lets us see you know, yes, is this a brain that's full of amyloid protein, or is it not, you know? So, now, there's a few caveats about that, because uh, there are some people who have PET scans that look like advanced Alzheimer's disease, but they're perfectly normal people. And the reverse is also true. Sometimes we think it's absolutely a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but yet the PET scan is normal. So, these are unanswered questions, and these are technologies that will come in the future. Uh, but there's, at the moment, too much, too many unanswered questions to use these kinds of things as a routine. We don't have the answers as to how we would use them. Um, and so they're, you know, reserved for um, research uh, purposes by and large, uh, currently. Okay, so we'll move on to treatment. Um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, things that um, is really important to note is that um, treatment really should begin with uh, an understanding of the diagnosis, uh, both for the person and for their family. Um, and then um, there needs to be uh, a concerted effort to look at the whole lifestyle issue for that person. So um, there is increasing evidence. Um, there's multiple studies in the literature in the last 10 years or so indicating the uh, benefit of a routine 
uh, exercise program. Um, not sure entirely if it's completely related to the improvement in circulation um, that that creates that um, that benefit, or if it's something else. But the evidence is pretty solid that there's a great deal of benefit to gain from uh, a regular exercise program. Uh, social and uh, mental stimulation, so social engagement uh, and maintain maintenance of routine sort of social activities as much as a person can tolerate is also highly recommended. And uh, dietary factors may be uh, an issue as well. So just coming back to the vascular question again, um, cardiologists are currently recommending uh, the Mediterranean diet. I don't know if you guys know what that is. You move to the Mediterranean. Yeah, let's all move there. That would be the best, the best solution. Um, but uh, the Mediterranean diet is uh, um, uh, it, the, the, the fat content uh, comes from uh, vegetable oils, primarily olive oil. The protein content comes from, uh, from um, fish and from uh, legume type uh, vegetables. Um, and, uh, uh, and there's a high amount of um, uh, uh, fruits and, and uh, vegetables and berries and that, things that have antioxidant properties. So this is highly recommended, as well as uh, a drink of a glass of wine, red wine, every day. <laughs> That's the good part. <laughs> so, and, and How long do you have to be before you can have that every day? Oh, well, you got to be at least to the age of majority, right? <laughs> But uh, um, they do recommend that, and the, the amount of recommended uh, red wine actually struck me as being, uh, you know, fairly, fairly good recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 suggest, they suggest 250 to 500 milliliters, which is half a liter of red wine. That's a lot yeah. of red wine. Well, yeah. if you have it with dinner, it should be fine. Right. That's that's the intent. Is that this is this would be the lifestyle of the Mediterranean? <laughs> exactly. it, yeah. You've adopted all the portions of it. Right? Way ahead of us when it comes to balanced diet. And now you know these factors are very important in middle age. You know, but they're also and and in middle age you're looking at prevention and delay. You know, of onset of any symptoms. They're still important when the person actually has symptoms already because it's particularly the social engagement and the, uh, and the uh, physical exercise. These are very good ways to prevent delay uh, or delay you know, progression of symptoms as well. So, you know, uh, motherhood and apple pie. <laughs> uh, in terms of drugs, uh, so this is what physicians are best at, is uh, looking at the, the types of medications that are available. So these are the uh, four um, drugs that are currently available in Canada in terms of treatment. Um, these drugs are symptomatic treatments. They do not cure Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they do not affect the lifespan of the person. They provide a little bit of symptomatic relief while the person is living with that condition. Um, the analogy to this might be, you know, if you have a headache and it's because your blood pressure is too high, the aspirin that you take will help your headache, but it won't be doing anything for your blood pressure. There's got to be another approach to that. Okay, so that's what these drugs are. They're symptomatic drugs. Um, they do tend to show some benefit in terms of improving quality of life for the uh, individual uh, involved, and they do keep people in the earlier stages of the, the illness for longer, um, but they don't affect their overall lifespan. So. Um, I don't know if you have specific questions about these drugs or how they work. I can get into that if you want, but it's it's also a fairly complicated kind of chemistry, so I'll save that for any questions that you may have. And, and we, we have the information sheets on the on the four medications mm -hmm. and to provide information and so that people can do their own comparisons between them equally. Right. Uh, but it's provided for information. So if people want that specific information, we can tell them. So, um, so that I think is uh, the end of, uh, of uh, what I have to say about it, unless you uh, have uh, any other questions that I can answer today.